Hello and welcome to the Grow Grow podcast. I'm your host as always, Kel Quinn, and joining me today is Cal McFadden. Um, many of you will know him from Football CFB and the Beyond the Pitch My Night podcast. Welcome to the show, Callum. How's it going? I, I'm doing well. Uh, delighted to, to be back on the show. As you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of the show. Enjoy listening to it, especially after a United victory. Although this is a United victory that we're going to talk about, I'm sure. Well, maybe, maybe you don't share the same views as me, but I, I must say I'm, I'm quite worried about it. Yeah, I have to admit, yeah, I, I share Paul's goal sentiment from last night. Uh, it, it wasn't very convincing. You know, going forward, I know we got the win, and it was a great second half. Second half, you know, attack and display, but ultimately, the, the first half was is everything that we've been worried about in the last few weeks. And at half time, we were thinking Ollie might not even get to be in charge of the Liverpool game. It was that bad. So I'm still very concerned despite the result. But we'll talk about the positives first half uh, beforehand. Um, Ronaldo scoring yet another winner. In, in the Champions League, just as he did against Real. Um, many people are saying Ronaldo's getting all the out of jail at the moment. Um, uh, I suppose you could argue that both him and, and De Gea are doing that. Um, a terrific ball from Fernandez for Rashford's goal with the outside of his, his right foot. And uh, loved um, the, the cross from Fernandez again for Maguire's goal and also the way Cavani it was so shrewdly ducked out of the road. Um, yeah, some great uh, attacking performances in the second half, but yes, yeah, very, very concerned from a defensive point of view in, in the first half. So what was your overall thoughts on the second half performance, first of all, Callum? The second half, I thought, was was very positive. I thought, obviously, bringing Pogba and Cavani on was, was a sensible option. Matic coming on just to sure things up in the last few minutes, a, a wise decision as well. So, uh, um, sorry, with, with Sancho as well, I think. I think he, he, he made good substitutions and I think they were positive, proactive substitutions. And given the, the first half that he had, he, he simply had to do that. I don't think he had any any option because, as, as you rightly said there, I think based on that first half, not just Manchester United supporters like ourselves, but, but just generally fans of football would have been watching the game thinking there is no way he's going to He's going to manage it against Liverpool on Sunday if this stays the same. Or United can see another goal. So, um, given the fact we were two 0 down at half time, I think it was vital to be proactive and start with intensity in the second half. And to be fair, we did that from minute one. Uh, Look, Shaw went on a, a mazy run within about thirty seconds in the second half, beginning and and that sort of set the tempo for the second half. Fernandez's first half, I felt, was poor. I felt it was very wasteful in possession in the first half, but you see the impact he makes in the second half and, and he showcases why he's one of United's key men. He, he can frustrate you at times, but when he's when he's on form, he's, he's absolutely sensational. And Ronaldo, I thought, played well within the game. I know Ollie singled out his movement after the game and, and I think that was probably something that he was wise to do because Ronaldo isn't going to press the way that a, a lesser striker would, would press... Um, he gets compared to, to strikers that are 10 or 15 years younger. That's unfair um, when you consider that he is 36. He is Ronaldo, of course, but he is 36. And at the end of the day, as long as he's scoring goals that he did yesterday, then, then I don't think many people will be bothered about pressing stats when it comes to Cristiano. So the, the main thing for me going forward into this Liverpool game and beyond is that United need to get chances created in and around the box because as Ronaldo showed last night, He's probably the best player in the air in world football now. And, and you could argue of all time, he's got an immense ability of staying in the air um, when he when he leaps. And, and, and the neck muscles last night show that he can generate incredible power and placement as well. So United need to create more chances in and around the box. But delighted with the performances of, of uh, Ronaldo, uh, Fernandez in the second half. And I was delighted to, to see Cavani make an impact again when he came on. Because for me... His movement is second to none, and he can drag defenders away from dangerous areas, which which can let players like your Rashford, Sancho, Ronaldo, etc. exploit. So I would like to see him get a run of games starting, if possible. Whether you can play him and Ronaldo together, I suppose, long term will be the, the challenge. But Cavani makes such a difference to United when he plays, and you saw that again last night with the clever movement. Yeah, it was absolutely fantastic here about Ronaldo. I love the way he hangs in the air like Michael Jordan like that and puts the ball into the, the bottom corner. We'll see him do that for Madrid, Juventus, and obviously United previously. Uh, the, the one downside to Ronaldo being the club is what you mentioned there. 
Cavani isn't starting games anymore, and I think we really miss him. Um, I would love to see Ronaldo and Cavani play together. Would that mean we'd have to switch to three five two, or could you see another way of Oli fitting them both in? I think three five two could become an option for United in the sense that the the, the holding midfield role causes a lot of concern. Fred McTominay being relied on after three and a half years of Oli being in charge shows you that that's an area of the pitch United have neglected for far too long. Um, at this stage of Oli's reign, you would expect them to have a an out and out holding midfielder of an elite standard in there, similar to a Canty at Chelsea. Um, someone that you could maybe play in a two with Pogba, but but that's not happened at the moment. And uh, as I say, I think a system change is, is a fair a, a, a fair prediction in terms of the the, the the three five two. The only situation with that is you you're then cutting out your your wingers and United have an abundance of players who play in those positions. You think of Sancho, you think of Rashford, you think of Greenwood, you think of Ahmad. Um, obviously not played a lot this season, but still in around the squad. So. It would be a big, be a big statement if if Ollie was to go three five two, but it's one that I think he may do for certain games, given the the lack of strength in the middle of the park. So an extra centre half wouldn't go amiss, and if you if you've got um, three in the centre of the park in midfield as well, playing more compact with your wing backs, then it could help United because we know that Cavani and Ronaldo will score goals if they're given the chances. So I wouldn't be surprised to see him do that. I don't think he'll do it this weekend against Liverpool. I, I think he'll play more of a 4-5-1 and, and really expect the wingers to be to be, to be be tracking back uh, with intensity because you're going to have to do that when Liverpool have got the ball. But uh, it's a system that I think United will try because Cavani's not going to be happy sitting on the bench all season. We've saw with the Everton game, Ronaldo's not happy being on the bench full stop. So it's important that that he comes up with a blend that can fit them both in, in certain games, and three five two would definitely do that. Yeah, hopefully we will see that at some point because we want to see them both in the same team. And you make a good point there. If we do play a three five two, it means the likes of Sancho and Greenwood and Rashford. Some of them would have to be benched, obviously, because they're wingers. Um, speaking of Rashford, I mean he's had an immense impact already, and he's only been back for two games and. I mean, he's only played, I think, a combined 90 minutes. He, he scored twice. He's he's had lots. Of, he's had other chances as well that maybe arguably should have taken. But that's what you know. Rashford's never going to be a one one chance one goal man. He he'll always miss a few. But his his pace of running behind is is an attribute that we have lacked since he's been out. And it's great to see him back and back scoring goals. It's great to see him scoring goals and it's just great to see him looking as if he's pain-free in the sense that even when he was running last night, just the, that intensity and, and, and lack of worry because obviously the shoulder would have been a frustrating thing to have to deal with in, in every sense. It would have been frustrating uh, in, in physical duels with full-backs and centre-backs and also a, a pain when you're, you're trying to get to full speed because you're always panicking that something's going to go wrong there. So to see the intensity that he's come back with against Leicester, albeit a poor game, but a very good goal from him. And even last night, Louis was wasteful in the first half. He was getting into those positions and it was the only second game back. So it's it's a big ask to, to expect him to score two and three um, when he is still going to naturally be rusty after a few months in the sidelines and, and not a lot of action at the Euros. So... I think he will have a devastating impact on United's forward line over the festive period as he gets up to speed. And he's an option that United have badly missed, given the fact that Sancho has had quite a slow start. So delighted to have him back. Wasteful first half, as I mentioned, but second half, I thought, in that first 15 minutes, getting the goal and, and getting into the positions again, looking more dangerous as the game went on, was was very positive. And hopefully he can stay fit because it'd be great to see a fully fit Marcus Rashford get an extended run of six months in the team rather than six weeks stop start like we've seen in recent years due to injury. Yeah, it's looking really positive already. He looks injury free and he's he's fit and firing and it looks like he could get maybe, if he keep, continues this for him, he get 20, 25 goals this season, no problem at all. Um, okay, the second half was full of positives from an attacking point of view, but we're going to talk about the the the, 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 the first half now, which was extremely worrying. Um, once again, we're conceding silly goals from set pieces, despite the fact that Ollie brought in a set piece coach, Eric Ramsey. I'd love to know what the hell he's doing. Um, I, I, another silly goal was conceded before that. Um, teams getting in behind us far too easily. Uh, the cross being allowed to come in and not being dealt with. Um, 
and the performance in general in the first half was concerning. Um, from a tactical point of view as well, uh, Paul Scholes pointed out how the front four were too high up the pitch, leaving uh, Fred McTominay in the back four exposed to the counter-attack. Um, he, he said that if De Bruyne was playing against us, if he had that time and space, he would just pick us apart and it'd be, it's extremely worrying from the, from the tactical point of view. So what was your thoughts on the first half? First half terrified me in the sense that just as we saw against Leicester in that second half in particular, teams are able to play out against United far too easily. United press at times and then they sit off at times and there isn't really a consistent message there which which worries me. Under Mourinho, for instance, you knew United would sit off, you knew United would drop deep and then try and build when they won the ball. Under Oli, they kind of press and then kind of sit off and then sometimes really press with intensity and then really don't press at all and sit right back. So it's I, I find it confusing to watch um, from a tactical point of view when you compare United to the likes of Chelsea, who aren't more of a compact team compared to likes of City and Liverpool, who uh, look to dictate play and press a, a lot more than I would say Chelsea do. So it, it, it's definitely concerning because the, the standard of goal that was conceded was, was, was diabolical. Given the fact that United conceded four at the weekend, you would expect you would have expected them to start the game in a in a tighter fashion defensively, but but they were cut open with ease. And you mentioned Eric Ramsey; he he must be absolutely panicking about his role at the club. I know he's only just come in, but you you, you saw the the difference that Thomas Gronemark, the the throw in coach, made at Liverpool over a, a period of time, and. And, and, and Eric Ramsey's shown no impact so far. You, would, you could even argue United has regressed in set pieces. So you'd be hoping it's just a slow start and that things can improve quickly for United and, and, and you'll see a consistent improvement over the piece um, for the rest of the season. But at the moment, it's it's baffling. Um, Luke Shaw trying to be a blocker last night and and, and, and unfortunately for McConnell that he's not able to do that. And before you know it, Demir has got it in the back of the net and you're 2-0 down. So... It's something that needs to be addressed because the Premier League's got lots of teams close to the bottom that, are, that excel from set pieces. I know we've already played them in the league, but you think of West Ham with a player like Socek, you think of Albona scored a set piece at the weekend. These are teams that will hurt United if they don't um, straighten that defence up when it comes to, to corners in particular, because it, it, once that's a glaring weakness, teams will target it. We saw it when De Gea came into the team all those years ago under Sir Alex Ferguson in 2012. He was weak from corners, so teams crowded them at corners, and and that's something that simply cannot happen um, with this United team again. De Gea, I must say, to his credit, it's been fantastic this season. I don't think you can be criticised for too many of the goals, but he must be a frustrated goalkeeper watching Maguire and Lindelof in front of him again because they weren't good enough as a partnership last season. They're, of course, only playing out of necessity with Varane's injury, but Lindelof again last night, Kyle, was, he, was, he, he gets turned far too easily. Uh, you saw that even in the second half as well when Zapata came on. He, he always looks nervous and you never, well, I never anyway look at him and say he's definitely going to win a physical battle. I feel that he's always going to lose out to, to opposition players physically. He's not the most mobile. Um, you could say he is decent on the ball, which is fair enough, but against teams like Atalanta, just being good on the ball is not good enough because for all that a few people on Twitter seem to think Atalanta are minnows. They've consistently finished in the top four in Serie A in recent years. They've caused some big upsets in the Champions League. So they're a team that you should be taking seriously. And unfortunately, last night, I just wasn't convinced at all by Lindelof first half or second half. Maguire, of course, comes into the game having had the shocker at Leicester. He had a poor first half, but he stuck in there second half, got the goal, and hopefully that'll help his confidence. But defensively, I, I still worry for United. Strangely, but Juan Bissak is good defensively, but going forward, I still think he's very poor and, and, and is worried when he gets the ball. Albeit last night, I thought there was an improvement on that second half where he was driving forward at times and, and looking to get the ball to, to players that are more comfortable than him um, when he got into the final third, which was pleasing. So that was a positive. Shaw's uh, cross for the winner was a positive, but defensively, still a lot to do with that back four. Um, you could you could argue they are exposed as you've said with the front four or front five against Leicester being pushed up so far. But United need to work on that cohesion between the the final third and the middle third because if that defence with Lindelof and Maguire is a back two, 
um, at centre back. It continues to be exposed. Teams like Liverpool and City are going to punish you, as Paul Scholes said, and, and the game could be out of sight at half time because with the forward lines that they've got, they aren't going to show any mercy in front of goal. Yeah, uh, Gary Neville and Jimmy Cagher pulled up the stats on on pressing you know, f- forwards in, in the, the among the top teams in the Premier League, and there was only one United player in the top ten uh, of the pressing stats, and that was Jadon Sancho. Uh, the rest of them were from Chelsea, Liverpool, and City. So it seems as if their forwards do a lot more work off the ball than what ours do. And was it Peter Crouch who said last night that this? This level of work rate from you know, United's forwards would not be tolerated by you know Thomas Tuchel, Jurgen Klopp, or Pep Guardiola. So why why is Solskjaer tolerating it? The problem I think Oli has though is you think of the profile of forwards before Ronaldo comes in. You think of Sancho. You think of Rashford. You think of Greenwood. You, you, you were thinking they were probably going to be a front three. Uh, at times for United with Cavani starting uh, the games that he was fit for. You bring Ronaldo in, he's a completely different type of centre-forward, albeit one that you simply can't ignore with the goals that he gives you and the, the overall impact that he'll have on the team off the park and the dressing room as well. But him coming in changes United's game plan. And unfortunately, I know Gary Neville's mentioned that in 2008-9, Sir Alex Ferguson could play Ronaldo through the middle and the rest of the team could work for him. I think against the truly elite teams, that simply won't, can't be the case anymore. And to be fair to Ronaldo, we saw him uh, working a lot harder last night, in my opinion. So he needs to buy into the press as well. Um, I'm not saying he's going to be able to impress with the intensity of Sancho, Rashford, Greenwood, etc. But he still has to be involved because you simply cannot carry anyone, even someone like Cristiano Ronaldo in the very, very top games. Lionel Messi being the same at Paris Saint-Germain. In those very top games against a Bayern Munich, a Man City, a Liverpool, everyone has to be singing from the same hymn sheet. We've seen that with PSG in recent years where they've had an illustrious team of star-studded names, but they get picked apart by the better teams because they aren't all in it together. And and that's something that Ollie has to work on. He has to strike a balance there. Fred and McTominay, I suppose, give him that balance in terms of being more confident with those two in the holding role. But as we both know, that Kyle, they, they still have glaring weaknesses of their own so I think he's going to have to be ruthless Crouch is right that Klopp and Guardiola and Tuchel wouldn't tolerate that but I also think those managers with the stature that they've got in the game as coaches would have the bottle to be able to leave players out and, and as I say all he did it last night with Pogba um, be, being put on the bench so he's shown last night that he can do it but is he going to be willing to do that in the games against City and Liverpool as well, because he is going to have to leave some big names out because the Leicester game showed when you try and shoehorn every single one of the, every single one of them into the team, it just doesn't work. So he's going to have to be bold, be brave, and continue to be that way until he addresses that whole midfield role. Whether he will be able to do that with the egos in that dressing room, I'm not quite sure. But if he wants to survive as United manager for the medium term, then he has to be bold and look after himself and be selfish because at the end of the day if United go and put in performances they did against Leicester and the performance they put in in the first half last night it won't just be City and Liverpool that trouble you it'll be other teams in the league as well because the Premier League's got a strong core of teams You're, I know United have already played Leeds but Leeds are the sort of team that at Ellen Road can beat anyone, you think of Everton that have caused this trouble, you think of Aston Villa that have already caused this trouble there are other teams in there that can do that to you in the Premier League as well so he has to make sure that he finds a balance. And if that means up or upsetting one or two of the major stars, then quite simply he has to do that. And, and if he is going to upset them, maybe he can rotate it so that they're all getting time on the bench. It's not just the same player all the time like Van de Beek's had so far at United. So it's going to be an interesting few weeks. But last night certainly showed that um, when United are chasing a the game, they can score goals. But we need them to score goals from the get-go. And, and that's still the concern for me that... United come to life when they go a goal behind or there's been a red card or there's been something that's went against them. I want to see United start a game with the intensity they started that second half with and I don't think that's too much to ask and there's been a lot of scrutiny among the coaching staff, Keenan McKenna and others. They have to realise that and they have to make sure United can start a game with intensity rather than be reactive because if you're reactive against a team like Liverpool, as Paul Scholes said, you keep repeating it, it could be two, three, four, five down at half time and then the game's a bogey. So I hope United can can start games with intensity and 
and go a goal or two up and then maybe express themselves more freely where they've got that confidence and got a bit of a cushion because unfortunately we've not seen that enough this season. Yeah, we are very, very top heavy, uh, as you mentioned. And I just want to say I love Ronaldo. It's great that he's come back to the club. He's a legend. And it, I mean, I've been dreaming about this for, for 12 years. Um, we were never going to say no to this. But here's a question I have for you. If we had assigned Declan Rice instead of Ronaldo, would we be a better team? Bearing in mind that we've got Cavani up front. I think you, there is an argument you could make for that um, in that whole midfield role, but I'm going to be controversial and say that I don't know if Declan Rice takes United on to that next level. Declan Rice is an improvement on Fred and McTominay, but is Declan Rice of the standard of an Angolo Kante? At, at this stage of his career, I would, I would have to say no. Um, obviously, you're not going to get Kante, but if you got someone like him, then you could probably play Pogba in a midfield too, whereas I don't know if Rice would give me that confidence level yet. There's no doubt he's a, he's a very talented player and one that would improve United, but would he improve United to the extent that you'd be confident that he could play in a midfield too with Pogba? I, I, would, I would have to be convinced with that because even at the Euros when England were successful, he had Calvin Phillips alongside him for most of those games. He's also a very defensive-minded player, so... I think the position all he's in is he wants to bring in a top-level holder that he can trust to play in a midfield two with Pogba or a more attacking player um, rather than having to, to play a Fred or a McTominay alongside him. Again, could be wrong with that, but I think that's the direction he would want to go in um, if possible. Whether that's that's practical, obviously only time will tell. It's certainly not been practical with the, with the options United have got so far this season. But with Rice, I think, as I say, he would improve United, but and I think he would make United a better team maybe rather than Ronaldo coming in, as crazy as that sounds. But I think, I still think United, maybe there's got to be another option out there that United can look at because English players always have a premium. And would I be wanting to spend over 100 million quid on Declan Rice? I, I'm not quite sure, even though he is a top player. Yeah, I, I've been a fan of him for a while now. And, and then I watched his performance at the weekend there against Everton and Jimmy Carragher was analysing it on Monday Night Football. And Jimmy Carragher actually compared him to Roy Keane in that performance. Obviously, we're not saying that he's he's at that level at the moment. But that performance against Everton was, had, had Roy Keane written all over it. All the, the, the tackles and the interceptions he was making and, you know, receiving the ball and playing it forward in, to the attacking players. He was just... He was... It was a proper box of box performance, and we see him do that in the Europa League for West Ham as well, scoring goals. And he seems to be a player that's that's taken this game on to another level since the Euros. So I'm I'm more and more convinced that 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 he would be a top sign for United and in, in the midfield area and be a huge improvement. And I think we've got because obviously uh, Fred is just not top level, nowhere near it. Um, Maric is obviously at the back end of his career. And McTominay for me is I don't, he's he's a bit of a like a John O'Shea or Phil Neville. He's a versatile man, and I think in midfield he's he's probably better going forward than he is defensively. He's not a specialist uh, number six, so for me, I think Dak and Rice would be a fantastic signing. But I don't think it would solve all our problems. I think there is serious problems uh, with the team in terms of. The, the coaching on the on the tactics and um, there's still no identity to this team and it's extremely worrying um i'm i'm a, a bit concerned going into the liverpool game especially given the form that they're in you know on the way mo salah in particular is playing he's some of the play at the moment from salah it reminds me of lionel messi as ridiculous as that sounds um so it's it logically it's hard to see anything other than liverpool win here but I could see United will be up for it on the, the giving the everything they've got, the crowd will be behind them. But uh, I don't know what you think, but it's really hard to see anything but a Liverpool win here. I don't think Liverpool win 4-0 or anything like that, but it's hard to see us beat them on the day. At the moment, I agree with you. It certainly is hard, but given the performance in that second half and the momentum that hopefully will be built from that in terms of confidence within that dressing room, you've got to hope United can start the first half against Liverpool with the intensity they started the second half with against Atalanta. Now, as I say, I agree with you on Declan Rice. I would sign him for United. I think he'd improve United, but I still think United have got other issues that need to be addressed as well. 
for me, um, the right back situation needs to be addressed at some point. Wan Bissaka badly needs competition, in my opinion, because Dallow's certainly not given him that. And I would like to see United have an option where they could rotate the right back slot for maybe a more attacking right back to come in in certain games at home, um, who can create more for the likes of Ronaldo and Cavani when they're playing in that centre forward position because they're both good in the air. And Wan Bissaka for me just isn't good enough at delivering that final ball. So that's a position I also think United need to address longer term too. Um, get into the game this weekend. I do at the moment see a Liverpool win. Um, and I think, to be honest with you, I'll probably, as daft as it sounds, make my mind up within the first 20 minutes. If United come out and they're passive in the first 20 minutes, then I see nothing but a Liverpool win, if I'm honest with you, because that they can only hold out for so long, in my opinion. And most teams, I think, could only hold out for so long against that Liverpool team at the moment, with Salah, as you say, who, who's been extraordinary so far this season and, and certainly is the best player in the Premier League on form, in my opinion. Um so I think United have to start with intensity or or it could be a long afternoon. As, as you say, I don't think it'll be fours or fives, but I think it could be pretty comprehensive and comfortable for Liverpool unless United take the game to them in the first 20 minutes and get the crowd on side straight away because the last thing you need is an early Liverpool goal because when that frustration seeps through the ground, especially in a game like that, it could be a long old afternoon. But as I say, if United can start well, then then I have no doubt they can at least get a point and potentially beat Liverpool and, and showcase that they can play well in these big games as they've shown before. Yeah, we cannot afford to go 2-0 down in this game because I think they'll just blow us away. It's crucial, I think, that we, we get the first goal. Um, like, like we have done at Old Trafford against Liverpool in the past. Uh, one one uh, match springs to mind is uh, under Mourinho and I think Rashford scored two early goals. And then I think we, typical Mourinho, we sat back in the second half and we ended up just winning the game 2-1. I think Eric Bailly scored an own goal. But we need, to, we need to start in this game the way we did in that one and come straight out of the traps and, and score early. I cannot give Liverpool the initiative because they'll not last, allow us back into the game the way Atalanta did. Uh, they, they certainly won't allow us back into the game, as you say, and I think... As Skull said last night, Klopp will be analysing that first half quite a lot and preparing his team with that first half in mind because United have consistently started games slowly. I mean, Ronaldo played incredibly well in front of goal in that Newcastle game, but it nearly t- it took United almost 48 minutes to break down Steve Bruce's Newcastle, who I know he's away now, Steve Bruce, but they've been awful this season. And, and that, to me, was a massive worry. Um because if United can't score and, and dominate the game against a team like that early on, then, then what chance realistically do you think they've got against a team like Liverpool? But given the, the nature of the late goal from Ronaldo and the comeback, I just hope United start with intensity and, and confidence given the given the fact that, as you say, Ollie essentially did get out of jail and hopefully it can be something that, that builds towards lasting momentum rather than just a, a 20-minute spell. I want to see... United play well for a consistent 90 minutes and get a win when it really matters. And there's no better way to do that than against Liverpool. So what happens if the worst uh, comes about on, on Sunday and we do get beat uh, 2-1, 3-1 by Liverpool or worse? Is Ollie's position under serious threat then by Tuesday morning? Could he be gone? Or do you think the Atalanta game is getting a wee bit more time? Unless United lose by four or five and get absolutely hammered and the atmosphere in the stadium turns, then I don't think they'll go anywhere. Um, I, I'm not one of these all in, all out people. I, I support Manchester United. And if it was Donald Duck in the dugout, I'd be, be supporting him to pick the best team and hopefully um, get a three points. So I'm behind Ollie until the day he leaves the football club. Always will be the same. Um, that's not to say that I don't think um, a change could help United. The only thing that I have said consistently on Beyond the Pitch and and on, on my personal Twitter is that I just don't see an obvious candidate out there like Tuchel was for Lampard at Chelsea, that you click your fingers and they come in and take you to that new level. I think any option out there um, that's out of work is, is certainly a risk at the moment. Brendan Rodgers has been mentioned, the manager who I really do like, but he's a nearly man in my opinion and I don't think he'll take United to a Premier League or a Champions League even if he gets the job. So... Because there is no obvious option out there, unless United get an absolute drubbing by the likes of a City and Liverpool or crash out of the Champions League, um, then I don't think Oli will go anywhere. I hope he can build positive momentum. 
you mentioned the coaching earlier. It concerns me greatly as well. The fact that, as we've both said in the show already, Kyle, a set-piece coach comes in and United get worse at set-pieces. You couldn't write a script like that. They don't have a style of play. Substitutions at times have been a bit iffy, but to his credit against Atalanta, he got it spot on. And fingers crossed they can they can they can improve with that as as the games go on. The one thing I found interesting last night, and I hate to be a cynic, but Mike Feeling being heavily involved in the touchline for the first time, it feels like in in forever. Uh, I thought that was quite telling given the criticism that he's had at the club recently. So I'm interested to know if that was if that was just um for the cameras or whether he's making a more concerted effort or they're trying to share the responsibility slightly differently because Mike Feeling for me, even when Ferguson was there, isn't exactly renowned as as being an elite level coach. He wasn't when Ferguson was there and, and I highly doubt he's going to suddenly be considered a, a hands-on coach now that he's at United again following spells at Hull and Central Coast Mariners. So I would like to know what his role actually is on a day-to-day basis, but I did find it interesting that after the criticism of the staff, he was he was front and centre last night in a way that I've not seen him in a long, long time. Yeah, there was a high-profile journalist recently who, who says that Mike Phelan and Doran Fletcher don't do very much and that Mike Phelan massively overstates his role under under Alex Ferguson. So yeah, that was pretty damning criticism. So you're probably right. He was he wanted to want everybody to see that he that he was front and centre last night. I'm just stunned United and I know I've spoken to him before and people might be listening and saying it's just bias. If you were bringing back one of Ferguson's staff, it had to be Denny Mullenstein. The man is a hands-on coach. He's got experience of being a manager, albeit not for long, same as Mike Phelan, but he's a hands-on coach. Many players have talked about um, his influence on their careers, and he's someone that I would like to even see United bring back in now to help that coaching staff. He's a senior person uh, within football, currently working with the Australian national team. As I say, he's managed big egos before at Berbatov uh, when he was at Fulham. So for me, I would like to see someone like him brought back in and, and enhance the staff even further by Ollie, if that's at all possible, because I don't think an extra set of hands would be a bad thing for United or for Ollie, especially if they can bring experience, because that staff, Mike's feeling aside, is very inexperienced at the top level of football. Keenan McKenna is highly regarded, but he's been coaching with United for, what, four seasons? Carrick, similar kind of length of time, and obviously Ollie is known for not exactly being a hands-on coach. He's more of a man-manager and a motivator. So if United could bring someone like Rennie Mullenstein back to assist, um, I would like to see something like that happen um, because I think Ollie does need someone more senior and more elite in that coaching um, side to come in, as, as we've seen with the performances on the park. United need a consistency of cohesion to their game and they simply don't have it at the moment Get with the current staff. So I think they need to supplement that soon. Yeah, I think you're right. But I mean, Ollie's been in charge for three years now, and he, he's had many opportunities to bring in someone more senior, and he, he hasn't done that. I mean, it doesn't feel right to me that inexperienced coaches like Carrick and McKenna are coaching now a team of superstars. I mean, you, you got to think there's got to be times in, in training where, or even on match day, where the stars like Ronaldo and Cavani and Greenwood and Fernandez don't take these guys seriously because they're so inexperienced as coaches. You know, particularly Kieran McKenna because he, like Michael Carrick, is at least a very was a very ho- a high profile footballer who had won a lot of trophies. Where Ronaldo's probably never even heard of Kieran McKenna. You know what I mean? No, I, I totally understand that, and and I think. It's one of those situations where United need to definitely consider something. Um, even someone who wasn't a high-profile player, and you could say it was similar to Kieran McKenna. Paul Clement was very successful at Real Madrid now. Um, obviously, his managerial career has been, been very poor um, for, for the most part. I'm not saying United should necessarily bring someone like him in, but there's definitely scope to bring someone else in to really assist them. Because as you say, Darren Fletcher was kind of assisting them and then he's kind of moved upstairs that we kind of don't know what he's doing. So I think there's definitely a gap there that United should be looking to fill. But you're, you hit the nail on the head and you see all these had, had three or four years to bring in a more experienced pair of hands who maybe is more of a an elite coach on the training field and he's not done it for whatever reason. So if he's going to go out on his own accord, then, then I'm, sure, I'm sure he won't be for changing at this point. 
If I'm if I'm brutally honest, I just don't think that that, that Ollie's going to win trophies at United now, and I'm even more convinced of that after the start of the season. And and in particular, the games in the last few weeks, it's just not filled me full of confidence at all. I think he he missed the boat to win a trophy when he lost the Europa League final, and he just th- this season has just started off the same as every other season, and I just don't see us being successful under this coach. Yes, we love him. He's a legend. As a player, we know he scored that winner in the Champions League final, and that will never change. But in my in my humble opinion, uh, Oli will never be a successful manager at Man United. Uh, I would, what I would say is I think he's definitely progressed the team from obviously where Mourinho was. Now, whether you can define that as success, probably not given the history of Manchester United under Sir Matt, Sir Alex and, and other coaches through the years. So I think... I think he's definitely been a good United manager even at this point now. But I agree with you in the sense I don't think he'll go on to be a great United manager because this is the season where United should be challenging and if anything, they're going backwards. So as Gary Neville said in Sky last month, the best all he can be, I think, now for United is a bridge where he took them from the toxic end from Mourinho onto a path where they could recruit top-class players and maybe they just need another coach to come in and take them over the finish line and take them to that new level. But as I say, I think he's been a good Manchester United manager, but I highly doubt he'll go on to be a great Manchester United manager because under him this season, United aren't winning the Premier League. They're certainly not winning the Champions League. And if he was to be given an extra 100 million, 200 million, do you trust him to be the man to then bring it home next year when teams like City, uh, Chelsea and Liverpool will, will strengthen again? My honest opinion is no. I would love to see him do it. And I've, as I said earlier, I have faith and, and back him until the moment he leaves the football club. But if you're Manchester United and you want to seriously win a trophy, you, you should be thinking about having a smooth transition, whether that's this season if results turn or in the summer. Because even if United finish in the top four um, this season, he, he shouldn't be staying on next year. Unless he wins the Premier League or the Champions League or gets to the Champions League final, for me, a change has to be made and would be any other elite football club like a Real Madrid, a Chelsea, a City or a Liverpool give it in the current situation. Yeah, uh, he he might not even get to the end of the season if he continued to play the way we did against Leicester and in the first half last night. If he get battered by Liverpool, he he might not get past December. To, to be quite honest, um, and he, he could he, he couldn't argue against that because I mean he's been in the job three years now and we haven't even picked up a domestic cup. Um, yes, you're right that he, he's been a good transitional manager from the the low point of, of Mourinho whenever he turned the club into toxic and but he's he's made it a much better place uh, to work for the players. He signed so many great players, but I think he just needs to hand it over now to a world class coach. Whether that be Zidane, Eric Ten Hag or even Antonio Conte, I think we, we need to get a, a world class coach in, in, in the helm at Old Trafford to, to take us to the, the next level. To the promised land you know, of winning the Premier League and the Champions League again. I think again, I think that is a fair point. The only thing is, every single coach you mentioned there, I think, comes with the risk. I suppose all coaches do. There is no such thing as a guarantee anymore in football. You think of Mourinho; he was supposed to be the guarantee of a Premier League title, and obviously, as we all know, he wasn't in the end. In terms of Zidane, I think that the benefit of him is that he could manage the Eagles. He's managed Ronaldo before, he's managed Ferran before, and he's won multiple Champions Leagues in his first spell at Real Madrid. The concerns, English is not a strength of Zidane's. His second spell at Real Madrid was difficult, albeit the club were in a more difficult period as well. Conte, I think he's a proven winner. He'll demand um, a lot from the players and have United playing uh, defensively a, a more structured system. My only concern with him is, similar to Mourinho, bit of a hot head, don't quite know what you're going to get. Could alienate top players like Cristiano quite quickly if things go summer. And then last but not least, Ten Hag, great attacking coach, has achieved a lot with Ajax, certainly is ready for the next step. But if he was coming in, he would need to take Van der Sar with him, I think, because given that current football structure at United, a coach like that is going to need a lot of support to recruit the right players. Um, that, that he sees fit because he's certainly someone uh, along with Van der Sar who's been able to spot hidden gems in recent years and if that's to continue then I think Van der Sar would have to come with him so there's definitely pros and cons to all the candidates that would be out there if all he was to leave the club but there is no obvious one that you say he's the be all and end all so 
It'll be interesting to see what United would do should that situation arise. And unfortunately, I don't necessarily trust those uh, working behind the scenes at the club to get that decision right. So it'll be a nerve-wracking time even if Ollie goes for me. Yeah, I definitely do not trust uh, Ed Woodward's decision-making anymore, although he is going um, in December, I think, and then Richard Arnold will be taking over, but then he's just another kind of accountant, really, slash banker, so I don't trust him either. Um, these guys don't know enough about football to be appointing managers, and you know, you've know you talked about that yourself a lot uh, on, on podcasts and, and me as well, but we just got to hope for the best. Um, with regards to Von Rossar, that, that is the dream for every United fan, for him to come in and run the club. But the problem for him will be he won't get get as much responsibility at United as he, he currently has at Ajax. That, that, that's the problem. Um, and yes, uh, Ten Hag would be, he's a great attacking coach. We've seen him the other night there. Again, he got a big result against a big team, beating Dortmund 4-0. So that's another... You know, box ticked with, with him. He, he really does impress me. But like I say, every manager is a risk, uh, no matter who you appoint. Even even when Liverpool appointed Jurgen Klopp, it was a risk. He couldn't he couldn't have said for absolute certainty that he was going to win the league and the Champions League. So, uh, but I do think now is the time you know to take that risk on on, on a new manager. Uh, either depending on how things go in the next few weeks, if it, if things continue to spiral, then I would make the change in November, but if we keep, if we're still in the top four, still in the Champions League, then and um, um, don't win anything, they would make the change at, at the end of the season in May. Yeah, as I say, I think if United only finish in the top four, don't win a trophy and don't seriously get to a semi-final or a final in the Champions League, then there's simply no chance that he survives. Yeah, yeah, and, and he shouldn't either. You know, you know, and I know he's people don't like to criticize him too harshly because of who he is and what he's achieved at the club, but we just have to treat him on as a manager and you know, and be honest about it. Okay, we'll come on to the last but not least, we'll come on to the, the player ratings. And David the Gay again, uh, double that brilliant double save, uh, at 2 1, and that was so crucial because if we went 3 1 down, I don't think we would have won the game. I would give David De Gea a solid seven. Um, I think obviously conceding two goals isn't ideal, but the, the players in front of him certainly didn't help him out. And you mentioned that double save, it was crucial at that time in the game. So I would give him a seven. Um, 100%. Um, Arn Juan Basaka, uh, what do you think of him last night? Uh, you, you complimented him earlier in the show. I would give him a six. I thought his first half, like the, the other defenders, was, was quite poor, but definitely an improvement going forward in the second half. And and I think that's something we need to see more consistently from him because it's an area of his game that I feel just is a glaring, glaring weakness compared to other fullbacks at top clubs. So I would give him a six, but I, I think there's definitely still room for improvement. Yeah, again, in the summer, we didn't sign what we needed, which was Kieran Trippier. You know, he would have provided competition for Armour Basaka, and obviously he's, he's a better player going forward. So <laughs> we signed all these great players in the summer, but didn't sign what we needed. So that's a major disappointment and it's come back to haunt us really, to be, to be honest. So uh, Harry Maguire, um, very poor first half, uh, reminiscent of, of his performance against Leicester, but he scored in the second half. So I suppose you've got to give him a, a decent enough score. Um, yeah, in terms of Harry Maguire, I would give him a seven. I thought, um, again, struggling in the first half and given the game against Leicester, I was really worried for him. Um, because that was a dreadful performance and he looked incredibly uh, unfit. So for me, um, in, in terms of Maguire, as I say, I'll give him a seven um, because he improved in the second half and the goal was crucial. And Lindelof, um, who we talked about it earlier, he was too easily turned uh, for that double opportunity for Atlanta, which it was to get capped out, Brendan Lee. Um, and we've seen that far too much from Lindelof. He, he just... He's just never going to be a, a centre back that fills me full of any confidence. In terms of Lindelof, I'm going to be brutal and say a four. Um, I thought he was terrible in the first half. He got turned too easily again in the second half, and he just he doesn't instill any confidence uh, in me at all. So I think if United are playing him on a regular basis, then then expect shock results and disappointments because there is no way um, that they're going to be able to. To, to, to consistently win games with him at the back. We saw that last season um, in big games. He lets you down uh, last night. Again, he let United down along with Maguire to be fair in that first half. But 
you see the difference Maguire makes in that second half compared to Lindelof. So for me, it's a four and, and I worry about him against Liverpool. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? When when Varane's part of the back four, it suddenly looks like a really good back four on paper. When you take Varane out, it's back to the mediocrity of last season, isn't it? It is, and, and that's the worry. Um, if Varane's out for a long period of time, then you're in a situation where you're going to have um, you're going to have Lindelof having to start, unfortunately, because he clearly doesn't trust by, hence why Maguire, Maguire was put in at the weekend when he was when he when it was when he was unfit. So for me, that's something that that definitely will define this season. Depending on how many games he plays regularly, um, will probably define how how well United are able to build momentum because he's he's a, he's a weakness at the back. You, you saw that in the Huddersfield game years ago under Mourinho. He gets bullied um, whenever it becomes a physical battle, and teams know that. I remember that Huddersfield game very very well, unfortunately. Um, so Luke Shaw, um. We've talked about a lot in this show that Luke Shaw is not convincing defensively, but he's wonderful going forward. And we've seen a, another brilliant cross for him last night for the winner. i have given him a seven um, in the sense that the, the delivery of the, the ball for Ronaldo was absolutely sensational. It was pinpoint. And as you say, a great player going forward, still defensively, um, can be a bit lacking at times. But last season, his performances were an, were of an incredibly high standard for club and country. This season, I think he's taken a bit of time to get up to speed, but which United player, I suppose, hasn't really. They've all had inconsistencies, um, as, as we've all talked about. So it'll definitely be interesting to see how he gets on at the weekend, but I'll give him a seven because that pull in was absolutely sensational. Yeah, it was brilliant. Um, so what about your fellow countryman, Scott McTominay? What did you make of him last night? He, he, he nearly scored very unlucky. He hit the post, didn't he? And, but I thought overall he had a very good game. I think he played in Rashford for a chance in the first half. That was really good midfield play. But Rashford, uh, unfortunately, just hit it wide of the post. I think he may have been offside anyway. But yeah, I thought McTominay was pretty good last night. Yeah, I think for me, I would give him a six. I felt that he, he was able to do his job. Um, and obviously, as, I, as we've mentioned so many times, the first half was poor, but he was able to, to do his job over the piece and, and, and I thought he was relatively solid. Okay, so what about the man himself, the most maligned, uh, Fred? In terms of Fred, I think, again, I think I would just give him a six in the sense that he gives you legs, he gives you energy, he gives you everything that you know he's going to give you. Um, obviously, he could have scored himself last night, but um, I think he's, he's an easy scapegoat for people at times, but I just think he does. He does have certain qualities. His his um, ability to get around the park is a quality. The unfortunate thing is when he gets the ball, he, he panics and does not have any quality on the ball at times. So that's a concern. But again, like McTominay, over the piece, I felt that he was able to um, he was able to, to 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 do a job before he was replaced. Yeah, and he had a couple of opportunities last night to, to score, which he didn't take. He's not very good in front of goal either, if we're honest. Um, so what about Bruno Fernandes? Um, it, 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 was a, it was a typical Bruno Fernandes performance where he's t- trying to make things happen. He's constantly giving the ball away. But then it, eventually it does happen for him. He ended up getting two assists. And yeah, he, he made it, despite frustrating the fans for about 60, 70 minutes, he ended up producing the goods in the end. And, and, and that's why you can never take him off. That's it, exactly. If you were asking me about first half performance for him, I'd say a three or a four, but the second half I'm going to give him an eight because assists and goals are invaluable in football and and, and, and he's able to produce the goods when it really mattered when United were under the caution the second half. So I'll give him an eight because first half aside, he, st- he managed to step up to the plate when it really mattered and put, put um, goals in the plate for, um, for, for Maguire and, and Rashford. Okay, so we'll come on to the forwards now. What about the man himself, Cristiano Ronaldo, popping up with yet another winner in the Champions League? And look the way how much it meant to him, the way he celebrated the final whistle. I think the Champions League is the the holy grail for Ronaldo. I think winning that is above all else, and you can't blame him really. No, I think obviously he's won it five times, and he would love to add a sixth. So I agree, definitely as the be all and end all for him, and for him. I'm going to give him an 8. I'm not going to give him a 9 or a 10 because I think his overall performance was good, but I don't think it quite merits that. So I'll give him an 8 for um, the, the goal. You know, I think it's just uh, when you need someone in a big moment, he's the man you want to call on. So I'll give him an 8 for sure. 
yeah, he, he perhaps he would have got a nine had he taken one or two of his other chances that, that he didn't get, unfortunately. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what about Miss Greenwood? What what you make of him last night? Uh, Greenwood, obviously, still young, still going to have um, games where he is inconsistent at times. So I'm going to give him a six. I thought he was... He was in and out of the game. Um, I don't think it was one of his best performances, and, and you're hoping that he'll improve for the for the weekend because he's, he's a player that is capable of far more than he showed last night. And uh, Marcus Rashford, great to see him back and firing. I'm going to give uh, Rashford a seven. I thought his first half was very good, um, given that even though United were poor, but too wasteful to be given an eight or more. Took took the goal well, thankfully. Um, but as I say, I'll give him a seven because for for all he's good last night. Um, and getting the goal and his movement, he was incredibly wasteful. So I'm going to give him a seven overall. How would you rate uh, Oli last night? I'll be honest with you. First half, probably, <laughs> probably zero. <laughs> if you're allowed <laughs> to give such a rating, it was it was that bad. Following on from the list performance, but I'm going to give him the credit he deserves. I thought the substitutions were made at the right times. I thought the substitutions all came off for him. And he was able to get the result in the end. As Paul Scholes said, as we've both said, Kyle, you cannot ignore that first half performance. Deeply concerning. But when the pressure is on and you need to change it, he was able to do that. So I'll give him a, I'll give him a, I'm, do you know, I'm going to give him a six overall because I think seven, eight, or nine, seven, eight, seven, eight, nine or ten is pushing it given the fact that United were so poor first half. But for the recovery, I'm giving him a seven because. I didn't see United coming back after that first half. I actually saw Atalanta getting a goal probably 52, 55 minutes in and, and United crumbling completely. So credit to him for turning that around in the second half. Yeah, well, Some United fans have called for the team that finished the game last night to start against Liverpool. Uh, what do you think? Do you think that might be a bit reckless or would you like to see United be that positive? I think it would be great to see United be positive, but... Uh... Liverpool's the sort of team that if you go into it that positively, they could just rip you apart. So I'll be honest with you, I'm torn. So goodness knows how Ollie's feeling because uh, I don't, it's hard. At home, I think you have to be proactive. So I wouldn't be shocked to see him do that because if it was away, he could be very pragmatic and I don't think too many would complain. But being at home, it just puts a different dimension of pressure on the game. So I think ultimately he's got no choice but to be proactive because... Any United manager that goes into a game saying that they're scared or, or, or wary of Liverpool or City gets crucified, as we saw with David Moyes, and rightly so for what David Moyes said at the time. So I, th- I think he will be positive, but I do think you'll still, you'll still see him uh, being willing to put a thread or a mat at Sean off the bench at half-time if he feels he needs it. So we'll now just make our final predictions for Sunday. Unfortunately, I think Liverpool is going to win the game but I don't think they're going to absolutely murder us. I think it'll be 3-2 to Liverpool. Uh, what's your prediction? I'm going to go to each. I think there'll be goals in the game. I think United are always capable of scoring, but unfortunately, without Varane at the moment um, and without that holding midfield role being filled and neglected in the summer, they're always going to concede goals, unfortunately. So I'm going to go 2-2. And to be honest with you, if you offer me 2-2 now, I would take it. Yeah, so would I. <laughs> well, that seems like a good, good place to leave it, Colin. It's been an absolute pleasure having me back on the show again. Always a pleasure to join you. Fingers crossed United do the business on Sunday and, and, and we can all be delighted to get into next week because there's no better feeling uh, when United beat Liverpool. It's the game that you simply want to win and have to win and fingers crossed Ollie can do it because as a player, he, he played in the winning side in many of these games. He's had the better of court as a manager too. Let's hope he does it again this weekend and so do the players. Come on, United. Yeah, I really hope so. I don't think he's beaten Liverpool in, in the league. Yeah, I think only in the FA Cup. So it would be a good time yeah. to get the first win against Jurgen Klopp in, in the Premier League. So uh, we'll see you again sometime, Callum. All the best. Take care.